I'm, I'm George Santos, and I'm here with We Are Not Journalists. Coming up on We Are Not Journalists. If you're making $20 an hour to work at a fast food restaurant, Right? Is that is that six figures? Are you making six? No, you're no, making no. 40, 40, grand. 50, 40 grand. 50. So you have been a progressive in Texas uh, for That's a while. Right. Uh, your team actually tells us that you're like if Beto O'Rourke was capable of winning an election. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I am surprised my team said that. In the totality, everything is dark except for the horizons, which has this like little orange light. And it looks exactly like it does in the photos. You have the corona coming around the moon, which by the way, Earth is one of the very few planets in the entire universe where this is possible because the moon happens to be the right size and is at the right distance to occlude the sun in this perfect little corona. And they're saying that like in 100 million years, that's not gonna happen anymore because the moon is slowly drifting out of Earth's orbit. And that's it. I gave you 45 minutes to talk about the eclipse. We're, we're good. But we no no we we get it. In we get it. You you traveled to the path of totality. Yeah. And you, and you saw it it was beautiful like the thanks. Yeah, it was great. Okay. And you should go and everyone should Okay. You know Marjorie Taylor Greene uh said that the eclipse was because of Joe Biden. No no no, no 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 you don't you don't get to use Marjorie Taylor Greene as a way to talk about the eclipse more. Well, it's just because, you know, it's like end times. It's kind of, no. I said at the beginning of this conversation, I was like, I'm giving you 45 minutes. And that was after you had spoken about it for an hour. So then I, that's when I put a timer on. So the timer started after an hour. Yeah. And I, that was a 45 minute timer. That is yes. very generous. That's, that is generous. Thank you, Walter. That's really cool. And uh, hey, and welcome to We Are Not Journalists. I'm Maximilian Clark. I'm Walter Masterson. And on our... Largely eclipse-free show. Uh, we're going to be talking about some cool stuff today. California has a new minimum wage. We talked to a oh. state representative from Texas. And NPR is eating itself. Fun, fun, fun. But first on our program, some <clears throat> serious business. We have a correction uh, to make. A, and this is really our bad, uh, viewers. We're not journalists. But we do hold ourselves to a standard. And last week we implied that all robots are racists um, because of the Terminator movies and their lack of representation. And we mentioned Charles Dyson as the only black character and said that he was a DEI hire. And that's not true. Uh, Charles Dyson is a real world inventor behind the Dyson vacuum and that very powerful hand dryer that blows he's also poop water. not black no so he, and he's a white guy miles dyson miles dyson is the diversity higher in the terminator movies yeah and um we got that one wrong and thank thank you we had you know yeah thank you to the people in our youtube comments we do have standards it's like we we we, we pitch ourselves as comedians and people think that we don't care about the facts but we do and when we get it wrong we apologize and we will work harder in the future to make sure that our stories are vetted and researched and correct. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Anyways, our first story, Ted Cruz's penis is an innie. I haven't seen it uh, corroborated anywhere, but it feels like it's true. Yeah, it's not a vagina. It, yeah. it is a penis. It's just, it just, it's a little shy. It's like, it's like a groundhog, but it never comes up. Yeah, awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. World's smallest penis. Tell your friends. That's a we are not journalist guarantee. So what else we have, Walter? Well, California, they did it again. They just eviscerated their economy. Gavin Newsom has torpedoed the California economy again. Not surprised. Just destroyed it. What did he do? He raised the minimum wage to $20 an hour. Wow. For everyone statewide? No, just restaurant employees. Oh, wow. But still, I mean, every restaurant uh, across the state. No, not every restaurant. What, what, what kind? Well, if the restaurant has 60 or more locations nationwide, so basically like the big chains, you know, Subway Sandwich, Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's. Oh, okay. But for every single McDonald's location in the state of oh, California. Oh, not every single one. Uh, it excludes the ones that are in a grocery store, airport, or a convention center. But the ones that aren't. Those guys are The paying. ones that aren't have to pay $20 an hour. What was it before? 
Sixteen dollars an hour. Sixteen to twenty. Four dollars. Four dollars an hour per person for everyone who works at a national food chain with more than 60 locations except for the ones in a convention center a grocery store an airport uh, besides God. those four dollars yeah just, do some do, do some. some this is so ah! Ah! <laughs> And some of our listeners may not totally understand what the big deal is. I mean, this is 20 bucks. And sure, right now it's just 20 bucks, but you have to understand it's a slippery slope. Yeah. It's mission creep. It's the domino effect. It's chaos theory. Yeah, it's just like Jurassic Park. Yeah, a butterfly flaps its wings in China, and then they're hiking the minimum wage up to $20 an hour for major food chains. Oh, my God. And it don't... Take it from us. We have brought in an expert. An expert. Jesse Waters from Fox News was on a podcast, and he was talking about this issue and why it matters so much. Yeah. Let's play the clip. Okay, here we go. If you're making $20 an hour to work at a fast food restaurant... Right? Is that is that six figures? Are you making six? No, no, making no. 40, 40 grand. 50, 40 grand. 50 years just to exit to and add a few zeros. Yeah. Okay, so. 40K a year. Okay, full time. 40K a year. Yeah. So, and then right. if That's your right. husband or wife is also there, you're making $100,000 as a family. Sure. Both working at McDonald's? 80 yes. grand. 80 that, grand. That is, okay, that's crazy. You know, there, I mean, there you have it. I mean, black and white. They, they make $80,000, but also $100,000. Well, I mean, that's basically six figures. You, know, you live with your girlfriend, right? Yeah. So that's basically seven mouths to feed. Yeah. Right? Between the two of you. Yeah. Imagine if a Happy Meal goes from being $5, $6, to being, say, 7 or $8. $20 Happy Meal. $20 yeah, Happy Gavin Meal. Gavin Newsom's California. That's, that's a new normal. <clears throat> you buy two of those a year? You're spending like 10, 30, 40,000 dollars. Something like that. It's yeah. like a college tuition right there. That is crazy because that crazy. job really doesn't require much. So oh. it's inflating the entire, mm -hmm. you know, uh, labor sector. And, and the Happy Meal. And the Happy Meal. Unhappy, which, very unhappy. Which I'm very unhappy about. <laughs> unhappy, did you hear that? <laughs> unhappy. <laughs> this is like a Happy Meal? You're happy. <laughs> but you're not happy if you're not you're paying. Minimum wage. <laughs> uh, I'm starting to think that maybe Jesse Waters is an idiot. Wait, you mean the guy who thinks that twenty dollars an hour equals a hundred thousand a year? Yeah, the guy who thinks that forty times two is a hundred. That guy may not be as smart. When he finds out it's not a hundred, he's still mad. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. Yeah, that guy. And like, there obviously, like, there's the obvious reasons to be annoyed by this perspective, <clears throat> like the historical one that you think someone should be doing that job. It's just that person should live in poverty. Well, it's to get a better job. It's like he, he thinks that person should get a better job, and then the person that replaces that worker uh, should live in poverty, but they should also get a better job. There's that perspective, which is. Annoying. The idea that two people working 40 hours a week without breaks for an entire year. No breaks. Like barely get to spend a third of their income on rent. Yes. Right. If they have a one bedroom apartment together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's annoying, obviously. But I think the thing that really bugs me is the fact that he does think that $20 an hour is like six figures because that's what he thinks a poor person makes. Yeah, like he thinks his maid makes... Like a hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, exactly. Like it's just like, oh yeah. Well, the teachers. I don't know why they're complaining. Like, <laughs> you know, I like people are complaining that they can't afford rent. I mean, like that's that's them just buying chai lattes. Yeah. You know that that so so that that's the thing that really irritates me. It's just how out of touch all these people are, and they have such a platform to say their nonsense. Yeah. Also. Props to the other people in that video oh. correcting him on basic math. Yeah. And they're, they're like, we, we agree with you. Yeah, we, we don't want to kill the vibe. Yeah, but like we, 40 times 2. We got it. We got it. We can't let them. They're like, we they're have like, to do 40 times 2. They're like, yeah, 4 times 2 is 8. They're like, you know. Jesse, the, we got to. No. Like, keep, keep going. Poor keep people. Going. We're still need, laughing. Poor yeah. people should die. But it, 4 times 2 does equal 8, Jesse. <laughs> oh. and, and, they, and they do it twice. He's like, yeah. so yeah. So then he's like, so it's. 
it's forty thousand. Okay, um, so, right. So, so, so it's but, like so four times two. two that's a hundred thousand. They're like, no, that's that's still not that's still not a hundred. Like he was like, well, what's a hundred thousand? Guys, you're ruining my soundbite. You're ruining my soundbite. <laughs> But yeah, but Max, in all seriousness, yeah, this might be good for the workers. Yeah, sure. But what really screws over is the small business owners. No, but um, no, no. Remember, because this only applies to national chains, sixty or more stars. If you have a small business, you pay the normal sixteen. Really, Max? Then why is this small business owner complaining? that her restaurant is going to have to raise their prices. My hamburger currently is going up to 20 some dollars an hour. Yeah. So you found this video on debunction junctions. TikTok. Yeah. Did you watch anything after that? Yes, I did. Yeah. Cause he basically goes through and talks about how she is not affected by this. And she is constantly on Fox news complaining about Newsom's policies. So yes. For- so she's going to raise the price of her hamburger because the minimum wage is going up for other restaurants. But not her. But not hers. Like, like it's good for her. What is she doing? Solidarity, Max. What? Class solidarity. It's, you know, when um, people that share, they share common interests, they band together, they take collective action. You know, uh, rich people do it all the time. Oh, like unions. Ew. We just listen to this other clip. Um, and this guy, businessman in Redding, California, and he's just been devastated by this new win- minimum wage law. Okay. In an area that I do business in, Redding, California, at the end of January, 18 Subway sandwich shops, family owned, closed overnight. There are restaurants that are closing. There are 18 Subway sandwich shops in Redding, California, that closed overnight at the end of January. Wait, I'm sorry. 18. 18- Subway sandwich locations closed in Redding, California. Yeah, in Redding, California. There are still five. There's still there's five. Because Redding's not that big. Redding has a five digit population. They have less than a hundred thousand people that live there. Okay. And they can they need twenty three <laughs> subway locations? <laughs> that is that is insane. Is, so be, for, people for, just eat at Subway Sandwich. Okay, so for comparison. Los Angeles City, which has 3.8 million people, yeah, has 76 more Subway sandwich locations. <laughs> for, for for almost 4 million more people, they're like 76. Redding, California, like 90,000, they're like, we need 23 Subway sandwiches. We need one for every single, <laughs> you know, in the future that Subway dreamed of, they wanted a one-to-one ratio. <laughs> yeah. Like everyone would just have it in the re- yeah, living like, room. We walked downstairs. Where, where are pedophiles going to eat if not Subway sandwich? God, the only thing that would make this more insane is if the Subway sandwich closings in Reading had absolutely nothing to do with the minimum wage hike. Ah, uh, that'd be interesting if it had nothing to do and the guy was just making it up. Yeah. Can you uh, imagine? <laughs> that would be hilarious. Oh, oh um, what, what did uh, Debunction Junction have to say about that? I, I don't know leaves employees in limbo. But I got a question. Is this really about the $20 an hour law when it took place months before it was going into effect? Nope. As it turns out, Scott was lying. As this story from three weeks ago says, Delight Foods leadership sued over mismanagement of Reading Subways. And in the story's first paragraph, it reads, a lawsuit has been filed against the leadership of Delight Foods Incorporated (laughs) from shareholders alleging they've mismanaged or even embezzled Over a million dollars the shareholders (laughs) invested. Delight Foods is the company that owned the 18 Subway franchises that closed down several months ago. Okay. So the people that own these Subways stole a million dollars from investments because of the minimum wage. Duh. They're like, oh, the minimum wage is going up. We better... Start committing embezzlement and wage theft. Well, now. Now. Yeah. While we still can. Right. Legally. Well, not legally. It, what they did you know, sounds yeah, pretty still, illegal. Okay. Great. Yeah. Wage, wage theft is illegal now. No, no, thanks no, 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 to no, the no, woke no. left. No, hang on. Thanks, no. Newsom. Walter, Walter, calm down. I meant embezzlement is illegal. Wage theft is the most common cause okay, of theft, and that's right. basically yeah. never so, prosecuted. Phew. That's been declared Wage in the last. theft, it's legal for now, all right? But there's an election coming up, 
Yep. You know, you want to vote for Biden, he's going to make it illegal. God. Slippery slope indeed. You know, if I put a pe- drop of water here, it'll roll off this way. Second time, different way. T-Rex. Yeah. In other news, the paragon of journalistic excellence, the National Public Radio, has sort of devolved into a bunch of hissy slap fightings internally. There has been quite the kerfuffle over at NPR. Oh, I mean, what's what's going on? Was there a stampede at the Tiny Desk concert? No, 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 no. Did no. Ira Glass strangle someone with an NPR tote bag? <laughs> no, he's never done that. No, it's actually it has to do with their news desk. Yuri Berliner is a senior reporter and editor in their business section. And he decided to post a pretty damning editorial about how NPR has moved too far to the left and now is lacking in a diversity of viewpoints. Oh, my God. And NPR read this at the same time as everyone else. And they're like, hey, guy. (laughs) <laughs> you didn't want to mention that you're writing this article or talk to any of us? And so what's what's really disappointing about this article uh-huh. is that this guy is a veteran journalist. Yeah. He's one he's one of Peabody. He's highly decorated, highly respected in his field. Yeah, and and so Yuri Berliner wrote an article called I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. And in this article, he outlines stories such as the COVID gain of function, the gain of function, the lab-borne pathogen, Hunter Biden's laptop, George Ru- Floyd, Russia diversity, Gate. Russia Gate, exactly. And uh, talking about how NPR only wants to cover one side of these stories now because he fears that since Trump, everyone in journalism has been like, "Oh, I don't want to associate with fascism. We're going to overcorrect and become woke." And NPR wrote this article titled, NPR defends its journalism after senior editor says it has lost the public's trust, which is the most passive-aggressive thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Against some guy who says... Who works at NPR. Yeah. Like, and, and, and just the fact that they're all airing their dirty laundry together, like they're quoting each other, they're cross-quoting each other, they're talking about specific people who work there. For, for context, for our viewers, uh, this article was looked at People on the right mm-hmm. and are calling him a whistleblower. Right. They're, they're like, he has opened it up. He's finally saying what we've all been saying. The left is dominating media and squeezing and, us out. And meanwhile, like, he actually, I mean, he was, I don't agree with him. Mm-hmm. The thing like, But you look at the end of his article, it's just like, well, you know, we shouldn't defund it. It's, you know, there should just be change that comes from within. Yeah, it, I, it, I like working there. It's just I think we need to hire a couple of more Republican correspondents. Yeah, and I feel like he comes from that old like type of thing where it's like we need to just listen to like two different people with opposing viewpoints. Right, for balance. Yeah, like, and he wrote this article with Barry Weiss's, you know, this is like the intellectual dark web person <laughs> who thinks that like, you know, Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, like, you know, like they, they should, deserve a seat at the table. Yeah, right? they deserve Wait, a we, seat at the table. How for can sane people make people? an informed decision if they don't get viewpoints that they disagree with, which is fair. And this is honestly something that I think is worth talking about because you want to hear what the other side is thinking. You want to hear different perspectives, different ways to approach. But it's not, it's not presented as legitimate. Well, that's that's the issue. It's just today, modern conservatism is embroiled in QAnon, which means that a lot of their viewpoints are batshit insane. Yeah. Right? And, and there's no way to show both sides on an issue when one of the sides thinks that there's a lizard person yeah. who is puppeteering everything else. Like, if you let that person into the conversation, you're no longer having a debate on facts. Yeah. Yeah. So he talks about how Russiagate, there was all this coverage on NPR of Russiagate. And then when the Mueller report dropped and said that there was no evidence of collusion, NPR just dropped the story. Right, and, which is a mischaracterization of the Mueller report. The M- Mueller report said, oh, all of this happened. Yeah, but Russia the, definitely fiddled with yeah, the, the erection. Yeah, the Trump camp. <laughs> I'm sorry, you I think said I just erection. said. Yeah, I did. <laughs> they fiddled with the, they <laughs> did fiddle with the erection, all right. Russia yeah. fiddled with the erection. Yeah, they did. And <laughs> Robert <laughs> Mueller. <laughs> now that's a hoedown. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I saved it. So, um, they, so and, but there was no, they couldn't prove that the Trump campaign 
knew this. Right. And was operating. Well, they, they, they could prove Manafort, but they couldn't link it to Trump. Some of exoneration. Right. But he's like, Russiagate was not NPR's only miscue. That's not their... They were accurately covering it up until that point. (laughs) The only thing a conservative voice in that room would have said is none of this happened, which is inaccurate. Yeah. What's what's the next one? It's like uh, COVID gain of function, how it was a naturally born, you know... Yeah, the lab leak theory. Yeah. And then so, but there was, there wasn't anything. He's like, why weren't they covering this? And he even admits that there's nothing definitive that yeah. ties it to a lab leak. Which, he's like, why didn't they cover this uh, indefinitive thing? So this is the thing that bugs me. Because we likewise don't know that it wasn't a lab leak. Everything yeah. that has looked into it has been inconclusive. Yeah. So if you have a firm opinion one way or the other, you shouldn't. You should have no firm opinions on <laughs> yeah. this. right? Uh, now, I know this is going to come up in the comments somewhere, and we might as well address it here. Because recently, an Australian institute did a research study. Uh, They do risk analysis is what they do. And they asked a bunch of experts to look at the various things that went into the creating of the uh, coronavirus, like how it would evolve naturally, how it would get into the public. And they found through their risk analysis that it is slightly more likely than not that it was developed in a lab, like 61%. Yeah, might have been. But this is not a scientific analysis. Like they didn't like show this biologically. They didn't actually find any proof. They just did a risk analysis. Yeah, they just asked experts what they thought. Yes. Right? And so people right now in conservative media have been throwing this study around being like, there's scientific proof that it was leaked from a lab, which isn't happening. So when we're talking about it here, you may think like, well, didn't they just prove it? No, they didn't. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, And this is also the frustrating thing because I would love to have a nuanced conversation about it. I would love to. Because the implications, if China did manufacture this, are huge, right? And especially, like, if America contributed to this, huge. Yeah. But we can't have a reasonable conversation because any conversation circles around to the idea that it was Fauci. And he did this. pandemic. Yeah, pandemic to sink the election for Trump. And if you can't contain the debate away from those people, then you can't have the debate. No. And, and and I think this is the thing that his article is mixing because all of these things that he, that like they're all politically charged, but he thinks that the cure for this is by saying both viewpoints. Yeah. If one of those viewpoints is totally invalid, then it is bad journalism to include it. Yeah, like his part, he's the reason why New York Times is just trash. Yeah. They they're just like you know we need to have Tom Cotton write an op ed, <laughs> right? Like yeah. We need to, and if anything. Tom, Tom Cotton, oh man, now that we're on video, uh, do you think it's time to show images of Tom Cotton's weirdly long neck? Ooh, yeah, his, let's, uh, let's just take a little, you know, sidebar here. This is don't, if you're at home and you're listening to this and it's not on YouTube, uh, don't Google Tom Cotton's neck at all. Yeah, oh my goodness. We he should do a fundraiser for that thing where we could write the, like how much we've raised on his neck. Ooh, back <laughs> yeah. to the guy. Yeah. So here's the thing. The guy's, I, I think he's wrong. I think he's misguided. Mm-hmm. He's like, this is demonstrably false. How, the problem is, what's very worrisome about this is I think he speaks for a lot of Americans. Yes. And he is Absolutely. the reason that like people will go to Trump because they go, the left has gone too far. It's this... Same narrative of, like, the left has gone too far. Right. And another thing that, like, really uh, bugs me is after, like, trashing the DEI programs, and, like, he really goes into it for a while about how they're bad and how they're, it's annoying and like, there's a lot of implicit stuff about how it's ruining the culture at NPR. Yeah. The NPR rebuttal article has um, – th- Fernando Alfonso, senior supervising editor for Digital News, saying that as a person of color who has often worked in newsrooms with little to no people who look like me, the efforts NPR has made to diversify its workforce and its sources are unique and appropriate, given their long-standing lack of diversity. These efforts should be celebrated and not denigrated, as Yuri has done. And then they asked the guy, they asked Yuri about it, because he's sitting right there. Like, this guy submitted this from his desk. <laughs> At the I mean, place where they all work. Employee. Oh, yeah, of course. Because they're not going to fire someone for a difference of opinion. They, in fact, quoted him. 
After the story was first published, Berliner contested Alfonso's characterization, which must have happened with just yelling across a cubicle, saying that his criticism of NPR is about lack of diversity of viewpoints, not its diversity itself. I have never criticized NPR's priority of achieving a more diverse workforce in terms of race and sexual orientation. I have not denigrated their diversity goals. That's wrong. Except that he did. Yeah, except for he said... (laughs) In his article, that race and identity became paramount in nearly every aspect of the workplace. Journalists were required to ask everyone we interviewed about the race, gender, or ethnicity entered into a tractor. He he says that a problem is he declared that diversity on our staff and in our audience was the overriding mission, the North Star. Phrases like that's part of the North Star became part, part of meetings and more casual conversation. He's tearing into NPR with for pages and pages about this thing. And then in NPR's coverage of it, they allow him to say, unqual- like unquestioned, no, I didn't. <laughs> Even when he did, the NPR rebuttal's most effective thing is they are doing the thing that he's accusing them of not doing, which is soliciting opposing viewpoints and including it in their articles. <laughs> they're doing it in the article <laughs> where they're complaining about you. <laughs> But no, he speaks for a lot of people yeah. in America, and that like I read this article and it makes me scared that I'm like, oh wow, we're gonna lose the election. Like people are just gonna just vote for Trump because everything's gone too woke apparently. I Meanwhile, yeah. I don't think if you listen, I'm like the last few years NPR. I've, I've been wondering who bought it. Right, it becomes so neoliberal. Like there's they, so much stuff they're criticizing dude, during the student loan yeah. debt forgiveness. On they, left, right, and center. Like yeah, they, they, like, they had the, 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 the leftist economist and the right-wing economist, and they both agreed that student loan debt should be not be forgiven. It was bad for the economy. Yeah, they're like, well, I mean, I'm a leftist, of course, but, I mean, should the government really be intervening in terms of personal responsibility here? <laughs> yeah. like, I, I was like, this is okay, you're not. In articles where they talk about Trump, they still are treating him like 2015 Trump, where it's just like, this funny guy, day one dictator, oh, you know, he's just saying silly rhetoric. What does this mean? <laughs> like, they're, they're, not, they're not out there. I honestly think that if you truly want a balanced news team, then, yeah, you bring in a Republican, but you need to bring in a frothing at the mouth, like, eat your landlord leftist. And whatever the conservative guy writes on, like, there, it's a buddy cop film. You put them together, and they can only write articles together. Like, you need someone who is a leftist leftist. Yeah, no, I mean. Right? Property is theft. <laughs> No. Next to the free market guy. And you just you tie them <laughs> t- together by the elbows and they can't they, – they have one keyboard between them. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's how you solve it. Yeah, I know because they're – up to this point, they like get someone who's like super right wing. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, like their you know, counterpoint is like a center, center right, center yeah. left, like Joe Biden liberal. And so, yeah, it sucks that there's no registered Republicans in the newsroom. But Liz Cheney – is not a registered Republican anymore. She got kicked out of the party. And that's the kind of Republican that NPR would normally welcome in for balance. That's not who this guy is talking about. This yeah. guy thinks that like, oh, well, to have balance, we're going to have a debate between David Duke and Bill Clinton. Yeah, or like or like that um, that debate uh, with Destiny and Ben Shapiro. Yeah. Like Destiny is like a centrist. Right. And- like ben-, ben Shapiro is saying things like, like, I don't think government should solve anything and destiny is like well yeah i don't think government I mean, should get involved like, yeah like both both of them didn't they actually like there's so many times during that debate destiny goes listen i i agree with you but right and after the fifth time i was like I, oh my god this isn't a debate like what yeah. what like why did lex friedman think this is the debate well it was a debate in the sense because ben shapiro would go so far off he was just like kids in school do not deserve air conditioning. Why are we spending no, money on that? No, do, you, do you know what they need? They need a two-parent home. And Destiny would be like, we could give them air conditioning. No, no. he basically said no no free uh, meals at school. No, no, and, no that, and, that was a real thing. I didn't make that up. That is a genuine and air, thing. No, and air conditioning. Like, yeah. He, he, he was very comprehensive in yeah. his education plan of not giving them anything. Right, but anyways, but this is the false kind of debate that we have, and this is why the Overton window is shifting more and more to the right, because... You know, you put 
a centrist person and a far right person, and the middle ground between them is going to be somewhere yeah, over and then here. White people, white men, right, who think they're liberal, they listen to people like that, and then they they think, oh well, I'm I must be a big frothing commie, right? Because I'm not that like it, someone who's so cartoonishly alt right. And then, you know, yeah. well, that's no, what no, it but, but does to they, white people. They think that they're centrist and then they will vote for things like stripping women of the right to vote. The, yeah, against the 19th Amendment. R right, exactly. And you might think I'm exaggerating, but no, I'm not. This is a thing that is being widely shared by the alt-right. It is pervasive in their discourse. Here is Christian nationalist, which is a thing you can just be now, Pastor Joel Webin speaking, I don't know, at some sort of like, douche convention, CPAC or something. There's a lot of fears that people have. Here's one of them. Will women have the right to vote tomorrow if you wave that magic Christian wand? Opportunity yeah. to get out of it? Okay, why not? That, and, uh, that, I want to get into why not. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, because if we had a Christian nation tomorrow and women did have the right to vote, we would not have a Christian nation within 50 years. <laughs> okay, ex elaborate a little bit on that. Zinger. Uh, because the husband has been appointed by God as the head of his home mm. and no fault divorce and women's suffrage more than anything else ultimately split the household. Mm. So, mm. I believe that women's suffrage was just one liberal attempt by people who hated Christ to, to sever the covenant bond between husband and wife. And that's what happened. We would not have one Democrat president. This is a statistic fact. Yeah. Sure. I don't want drag queen story hour. Mm. I don't want rainbow jihad. And none of that could happen if women couldn't vote. Why do you have to hate Christ in order to want a divorce? Is that, is that, like, is that like a checkbox? It's like, well, you know, I... Uh... Yeah. You're not the person I was when I married you. I, I just think it's funnier that he just just went right into yeah. drag queen story hour. Yeah. It's like, I mean, he was, he didn't like have like sort of a bridge. He was just like, you know, women get a chance to vote and get divorced. We can have drag queen story hour. And you're like. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, because it's all one thing. It's all what the, it's the thing that Yuri is complaining about. It's wokeism run amok. Yeah. And because it's all squished together. And it's not just that, sports fans. Not sure if you saw this going around, but this is an elected official from Maine. <laughs> Let's talk about the Nazis. I would like to know, although I'm not posing a question through the chair. I love this. Not I would a question. Like to know Don't answer it. Don't answer what it. What they did that was illegal. <laughs> I would like to know what they did in detail, if folks would like to share. But not now. That was wrong. That infringed on another person's right. Holding a rally, and even holding a rally with guns, is not illegal. So, <laughs> doing a beer hall push is not illegal. I think that this is a great video for teachers to use in explaining the difference between morality and legality. I feel like it's like, it wasn't illegal what the Nazis did because they owned the government. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, State sanctioned murder is not illegal. <laughs> right. And, and it's just, also it's like, and to be clear, I'm not actually asking this, <laughs> but please explain in detail. No, no. I, I love that. Tell me one thing that the Nazis did that was impolite. <laughs> like, by the way, this isn't a question. Yeah. <laughs> this is and, just rhetorical. <laughs> and obviously there's some censure, but I feel like 20 years ago, this lady is blasted out of the party. Like, I feel like 20 years ago, the GOP is like, nope, you yeah. be an independent. Yeah. And also, good luck. Now she would rise through the ranks with that speech. This lady's going to have an OAN show by the end of the year. Yeah. And... Again, this is the problem. And and it doesn't even end there. Listen to this guy, Mr. Uh, Charles Kirk. I don't think there's any relation to the Star Char Trek guy. Yeah. Thinking no, I mean, like, that. you want to go thought crime? Like, I'm sorry. If I see a black pilot, I'm going to be like, boy, I hope he's qualified. <laughs> well, well, that's the You wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have done that. Yes, Walter. Every week, 
it, it, I feel like there's a list of demands attached with playing this. Oh, you mean like I'll stop playing this if X, Y, Z? Yeah. No. Like, no, you can't like, stop it. So yeah, like uh, your demand is that people stop watching. Yeah, like, I will. It, it, I will play this Charlie until Kirk. all of you stop watching this show. <laughs> Look, if you don't want to see Charlie Kirk be racist, why are you here? Yeah, why that. Are you here? You want, yeah. No, no, no. I don't take it back. I will play a different Charlie Kirk being racist clip if one of them amuses me more than this one. Okay, it's a high bar. But so I our Discord possible. link is in, yeah. In the so so throw it in the YouTube comments or the Discord link. I will gladly swap it out with another terrible Charlie Kirk video if you have one. Yeah, and it's not like they don't exist. <laughs> it's just I don't want to watch enough. I Charlie don't want to scrub through. Yeah, yeah. That's not, that's not an immediate. No, you want to do that. Who before. I am? That's no. not what I believe. It is the it's reality. Of the left, has but I yeah. hate it. I'm, I'm, it's the left. This is the thing that I. It's the only thing I can really hear. From this guy's article is just like it's not me it's the left making me embarrassed about the things i'm thinking <laughs> i went to sarah lawrence god damn it in theory yes it would be great to have an informed conservative viewpoint it would just be great if that informed conservative viewpoint didn't think things that were objectively wrong and utterly reprehensible that's it uh we do have something uplifting hmm we have James Delarico. Yeah, Delarico. Yeah. Telerico. Delarico. Yeah, Telerico. yeah. He's a couple of generations removed from having. Uh, yeah, he is. Any spice on that last name? Yeah. So he is a state legislator in Texas. He is a Democrat, and he's gotten stuff done, which he's is gotten really stuff impressive. Done, and he's reached across the aisle, and he's gotten really great things done. Insulin. Oh, no, that's it. Compromise. You can work with the conservatives. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. No, no, yeah, no, no, that's Italian. All right. That's it. That's it. Okay. We're not cutting this. That's the thing. Okay. <laughs> no, Compromise. We just realized it. We just realized what made this interview so special is James Solerico is a state legislator. He is very progressive on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. He has not dialed back what he feels on issues. No, but what makes him unique among progressives is he actually passes legislation in a deep red legislature. Yeah. And I think it's incredible. This is honestly what we should be talking about. Like, there are people that aren't performatively evil out there. Yeah. That, sure. NPR wants to hire one of those guys who wants to do some good. Great. It's possible to work together, and we'll show you how yeah. after the break. Welcome back to We Are Not Journalists. And as promised, here's an interview with someone that will uplift you. Just oof. palate cleanser, palate cleanser. Ah. Here we go. Come on, play the tape. We'll see you after the interview. Hey, welcome back to the show. Uh, with us, uh, we have a representative from the Texas State House. Which is the wonderful state of Texas. Wonderful. The, the Lone Star State. Yeah. The Lone uh, Star State. Yeah. The Republic of Texas. Uh, this is James Tallarico. That's Tallarico right. Tallarico or Tallarico? How do you... Uh... Tallarico. I guess if you're um, a telemarketer, it's Tallarico. But uh, we all... Yeah. And, and this is so weird because you're in the Texas house. That's right. I don't remember seeing you at CPAC. Yeah, we were at CPAC. We met, uh, you know, a lot of uh, conservatives, and we sure. did not see you. I know. I, I think my uh, my invitation got lost in the mail uh, from huh. CPAC, but maybe next year. So you have been a progressive in Texas uh, for That's a while. Right. Uh, your team actually tells us that you're like if Beto O'Rourke was capable of winning an election. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I am surprised my team said that. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I've been in the Texas House for three terms now. And even though I'm uh, on the progressive side, I've been able to work with my colleagues to get a lot of stuff done. So um, pretty effective um, yeah. for, uh, for a Democrat in Texas. And you were actually uh, responsible for uh, helping to cap the price of insulin in the state of Texas. That's right. Tell us about yeah, that. that's right. Uh, so I'm, I'm a type one diabetic myself, uh, actually discovered that I had this disease in my first campaign for the seat. I, I was trying to flip um, a, a red seat to blue. It was a district that 
had voted for Donald Trump two years before I ran. And I was trying to get attention for my campaign. And so I decided to walk the entire length of my district from Round Rock, Texas to Taylor, Texas, which is about 25 miles. And I walked the whole thing on foot and held town halls along the way. About halfway through the walk, I started to feel fatigued and nauseous, uh, actually threw up uh, before the second town hall. When I got home, I fell asleep and I stayed asleep for 36 hours. And my family got concerned and, and took me to the ER. And it turned out that my blood sugar, I don't think I'd ever had my blood sugar tested before, but it was 10 times the normal limit. And I was in a state of diabetic ketoacidosis, which leads to coma and death without insulin. When I left the hospital, I went to Walgreens to get my first 30-day supply of insulin, this new medication that I now needed to live. And I was charged $684 for that 30-day supply of insulin. And I didn't have that kind of money, still don't have that kind of money. And so I put it on a credit card. And I soon learned- You what? You just, you, know, you just get a better job. <laughs> I do. I just need to work harder. Um, yeah, but you, know, I, just, you know, get, I mean, you, how many districts were you uh, managing at that time? I should have represented you. Yeah. If you want to I, be able to afford insulin. Classic districts. lazy, lazy Democrat. Just wanting to No, represent. no, 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 Walter. He's done it the truly American way. He has used his political office in order to save him money. That's exactly right. Yeah. Self-enrichment yeah. was a big part of my platform when I ran. And, and, but uh, you were able to pitch like prescription drug cap to a, shall we say, not entirely progressive house? That's right. Yeah. You know, I, I, I passed this bill to cap insulin copays at $25 per prescription. So I was charged $684. Now you can't be charged more than 25. But once that bill passed, I realized that there was so much more we needed to do for other prescription drugs like EpiPens and blood pressure medications, cancer drugs. So last year, I worked with the Freedom Caucus, um, which I'm sure y'all are big fans of. Yep. And we passed a bill to import cheap prescription drugs from Canada. Be and, and, you know, as a progressive, I want to do this because, you know, I think people have a right to health care and all that uh, touchy feely stuff. But my conservative colleagues uh, supported the bill because they recognized that that big pharma is a monopoly and it is not a free market. And they, like y'all... Uh, support free markets. We talk to a lot of conservatives who are also free market libertarians or like big, big into freedom. And they usually have a pretty big carve out for big corporate entities. And that's because Big Pharma pays a ton of lobbyists in places like the Texas Capitol. Now, I remember when I was trying to pass this bill, I was in a committee hearing presenting my bill to the committee. It was on the basement floor of the Capitol, so deep underground. It was in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon. So most Texans are out working or taking care of their kids. And it was me. And behind me was an army of insurance lobbyists who were being paid to try to kill my bill. And so in that moment, I recognized the, the rot at the core of our broken political system. The fact that big, wealthy special interests have so much more access and power in our process than regular people do. Do you, do you remember any conversation from around that time where you were... Uh, talking to someone uh, uh, in the Freedom Caucus uh, or anywhere uh, across the aisle where you just had a moment where you're just like, wait a second, this actually might have bipartisan support. I do. I remember my colleague, James Frank, um, who uh, who represents uh, far north Texas, Wichita Falls, a pretty rural uh, conservative part of the state. And he called me up after I filed this bill. I, I filed the bill. I didn't really think it was going to pass. I kind of thought I was just going to file it to start a conversation. But he called and said, I read your bill. I think it's fantastic. Let's get it passed. And keep in mind, you know, I serve in the Texas legislature where Republicans have a majority in both chambers. So I can't get anything done without Republican buy-in. I imagine state legislatures, they don't have that sort of like, it, you look at Congress, there's so much media attention. There's right. a lot of pressure to be divisive and right. uh, showboat and things like that. It, like, yeah. is it easier at the state level? It is. It's it's getting harder, though. You know, the same factors that are that are tearing our politics apart at the federal level are now seeping into state legislatures. And you've seen the Republican majority here in Texas pass some pretty extreme culture war bills, including the most extreme abortion ban in the country. No exception for rape 
or incest or the life of the mother, a bill to ban books in public libraries, a bill to whitewash history, including removing Martin Luther King from our civics curricula. But there's still this opportunity because we're not quite in, in the same kind of spotlight that federal folks are in, that we can still come together and, and do some normal, good public policy for regular folks in our state. And, and I'll say we, we made progress on prescription drugs. And then some of that same coalition of Republicans and Democrats came together to stop Greg Abbott's private school voucher scam uh, late last year. Oh, that, so, was, that was just terrible. I mean, you know, like my family's corporation was set to get a whole bunch of government contracts from that. And we really wanted, you know, it was just a travesty that, you know, first off, you know, we were so mad that school is secularized. There's not a mm -hmm. crucifix in every classroom. And, you know, instead of, you know, this money going towards teachers unions, we wanted it to go to private faith based corporations. And I think as conservatives, y'all will agree that we shouldn't be giving our hard earned tax dollars to private institutions with no strings attached. There's nothing conservative about that. You know, well, we want I don't know that you followed conservative politics, my friend, because giving completely no string attacks uh, attached uh, like deliveries yeah. of money is essentially sure. all we do to corporate America. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that's like kind of a free market. That's yeah. I'm yeah. not sure if you're familiar with the uh, paycheck uh, protection act uh, during COVID. I mean, like we, we, we will just yeah. FedEx money. Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm talking about an older uh, Republican party or uh, um, the original sense of, of the conservative movement because. Oh, no, no, no. That's pretty woke now. Reagan is woke. You admit that there are some good private schools. So what if we took everyone in the state of Texas and we put them in those same two or three private schools? A few problems with that. One is that a majority of the counties in Texas don't have a single private school. So there's simply not enough supply to serve all 5.5 million Texas school children in the state of Texas. Wow. Second, uh, private schools can deny admission to any kid for any reason they want. And, and I don't have a problem with that. I don't want to interfere with private schools. Now, if they start taking taxpayer dollars, then we have to start having some kind of accountability for those taxpayers. But as it stands, uh, private schools can deny admission to any kid. So it's not really school choice. It's the school's choice because the school gets to pick who comes and who goes. And honestly, I'm a former teacher, so I know that you can really get whatever results you want if you can pick the kids, right? If you can just pick the highest performing kids. That's why charter schools are just doing so great. Yeah. I mean, you know, all of the charter schools that my family's corporation runs. I mean, I mean, you only take college bound seniors with high SAT scores in, in those charter schools. Yeah, right? and we recruit from, you know, yeah. very, you know, upper middle class neighborhoods. And, 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 and those students who are already going to Harvard end up going to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a true Cinderella story. You taught middle school, right? I did, and I, I didn't teach in a in a charter or a private school. I taught in a traditional public school in San Antonio ISD. I taught on the west side of the city, which is a, a beautiful historic Mexican American neighborhood, and it's also one of the poorest zip codes in the state of Texas. And so my students they they struggled every day to overcome poverty and racism and systems that were designed to hold them and their families and their neighborhood back. And so I saw firsthand, um, you know, how, how these unjust systems, whether it's an inequitable education system or a broken criminal justice system or an unfair healthcare system conspire to hurt poor and working class people in the state of Texas. And that's part of what motivated me to run for office and what motivates me to fight back against these voucher scams, because all it's going to do is take those hard earned tax dollars out of our public schools that are already underfunded as we speak and giving them to wealthy families on the other side of town so they can get a, a discount. Yeah. Well, I, I've heard that it's only 75 to 85% of vouchers go to wealthy people who are already in private school. Only is doing a lot of work in that sense. Uh, but yes, yeah, you know, it's, it's the, the vast majority of the funding for these programs in states that have tried these scams it goes to wealthy families who are already sending their kids to private school. So essentially, it's a transfer of wealth from the bottom to the top. You're, you're taking money from poor kids and giving it to rich kids. That's actually a good selling point. I'm going to tell my family's yeah, we can be corporation to sort of you can use, use that. that in their branding. You put it yeah. very succinctly. So thank you. And I just I do want to clarify, you know, I know your family, your, your family corporation, your mom and pop corporation uh, runs a charter school at least 
public charter schools have to follow the same state accountability standards. The kids have to take the same test. They, they have to teach the curriculum that's decided on by, by elected officials. There is, there is no safeguards like that in the private schools. There is, there is no democracy, no transparency, no accountability for those taxpayer funds. So right. there are a lot of problems with our charter school system, but it's nothing compared to the problems with the private school voucher scam. Once uh, the Republicans get into power, we, our plan is to get rid of the Board of Education and then we can you know, focus on making sure that these schools don't have to follow these you know, safeguards, as you were saying. What if we took the money that we're already wasting on public education and use this to erect new schools and fill them with teachers that we could hire from somewhere? I mean, if we don't have them in the private sector, maybe we can get them from the public. We hire those teachers and we fill these new uh, schools with these teachers and boom, that idea is predicated on the on the the lie that public education is failing. You know, I, I, again, as a former teacher, um, as someone who does education policy, I know that our schools are not perfect. I know that our teachers are not perfect. But I have to tell you that the data suggests that public education has been a transformative success in the state and in this country. You say that, but I have it on good authority that kids in Texas, they don't even know who MLK is. You got me there. And, and I wish I wish the Republican majority hadn't removed MLK and I'm hoping yeah. we can put it back into our history curriculum. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, let's not, I, we yeah, don't want white kids to hate themselves. True, true. You know, as, as a white person, I don't want to hate myself either, uh, but I do want to learn history and I, I want to know the good, bad, and the ugly of what's happened in this country. And I think that's how you build a, a true patriotism, a true love of country. We we don't want uh, kids to have a puppy love for America, right? You know, think about when you were young, when you were in middle school or high school, and you had puppy love for somebody. It wasn't a true commitment to them. You weren't seeing them in all of their their good and, and their bad. You were kind of just you, you. It was a superficial, a shallow love. My first love in middle school was uh, the flag. I sort of had a puppy love thing, and mm -hmm. got kind of weird sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. When they said the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, right. <laughs> he, he stood at attention, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Forget all this public education stuff and health care, all this woke liberal stuff. Let's talk about things like um, the border. This is a, an issue I care a lot about, obviously, as an eighth generation Texan. Um, my, my family is from Laredo, Texas, which is on our southern border. So um, I know this issue personally. And what frustrates me to no end is that demagogues like Donald Trump want to campaign on this problem rather than solve the problem. You know, we had a, a bipartisan border security bill in the U.S. Congress, not a perfect bill. I had, a, I had some problems with that bill, but at least it was a start in fixing this issue, which can be fixed. And Donald Trump urged Republican lawmakers not to pass the bill on this issue that he complains about every single day on the campaign trail. I can deal with good faith disagreement about solutions to our immigration system. What I can't deal with are, are politicians like Donald Trump or Greg Abbott who want the problem more than they want the solution. It's not like Greg Abbott is doing nothing, though. He's putting up an American Ninja Warrior course at the... He's drowning mothers and, and children in the Rio Grande, you know. Right. So, yeah, have... so don't say he's not doing anything. That's, yeah. Well, it is something. You know, I think about it. These are, these are moms who put their babies on their back and traveled more than 2,000 miles dodging traffickers, uh, evading cartels, trekking through jungles and deserts, fleeing the only home they've ever known. And to think that some razor wire is going to deter them, we're, we're underestimating a mother's love. And what we know works is providing more legal pathways for folks to enter the country the right way. Right, right now, there is no right way to enter this country because it takes you more than 20 years. The Democrats, it's a plot, basically, to bring over all these uh, undocumented immigrants and these migrants and then give them a voter ID card uh, so they could help steal the election. You know, I've, I've heard these kinds of conspiracy theories before, um, things like white genocide or the Great Replacement Theory. You know, this, this is not this is not just, you know, a political talking point. This has real world impacts. There there was a young man 
in North Texas who heard Donald Trump and Greg Abbott talking about this invasion from our southern border. And he, as an impressionable young man, decided to take matters into his own hands. And he took an AR-15, traveled to El Paso, Texas, and massacred 20 people in a Walmart parking lot. And I'll just say that the best way you can debunk this myth is that a lot of immigrants are conservative. They're socially conservative. They're culturally conservative. Many of them are economically conservative. A lot of them are small business owners. The, these, these immigrant populations, um, if they eventually become citizens of the United States, are a prime target for the Republican Party. If they would just appeal to them and try to earn their votes, rather than demonizing them and calling them animals and calling them criminals and saying that they poison the blood. Well, what would we have to run on? <laughs> well, I, you know, I think the Republican Party, if, if it returns to its conservative roots, has a lot to run on. I think there's a, there is an appetite in this country to conserve our institutions, conserve our traditions, conserve our environment, right? I, I think take a page out of Teddy Roosevelt's. Teddy Roosevelt, when he's talking about how we cannot let you know, these parts of the country just be infested with, you know, these uh, Indians and stuff. I'm not going to be drunk on Teddy Roosevelt, even in jest. <laughs> you take that back. <laughs> Close your whore mouth. You keep Teddy out of your, uh, out of there. So uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big if. In the meantime, have you considered the fact that, you know, Democrats love to say that these immigrants are doing the jobs that Americans don't want to do. What if one accidentally starts getting like a great finance job at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> you know, I, I, I taught a lot of undocumented students when I was a teacher in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to stereotype, but a lot of those undocumented students were my best students. And I think the reason is, is because those kids have a such a deep appreciation for America. More than I did when I was growing up, more than a lot of native born kids have grown up because we take it for 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 granted. And these kids whose parents have have sacrificed so much to get them here know what a blessing it is to live in this country. And so they worked twice as hard as as I did when I was in school and some of my native born students did because they understood what the American dream is and their bones. And, and those are the exact kind of people we want to bring to this country. They're going to help us grow our economy. They're going to revitalize industries uh, across our state and our nation. And they're going to make us better like they always have. Right. I, you wouldn't be talking to me with my last name, Talarico, if we hadn't had Italian immigrants uh, coming to this country in the early 20th century. I agree. You know, we wouldn't have to be dealing with you if it wasn't for the Italians. Oh and goodness. letting them in you know, here. If only we had Donald Trump building a wall around the Atlantic. Right. It was, you know, light, lightning round on immigration, though, because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of fancy talk. So cutting right to it. Immigrants, do they pay taxes or not? They do. They actually, you know, they're, a, they're a net gain because they pay a lot in taxes. Okay, and, okay, okay, okay. okay. Do, do they commit more crimes? than a uh, normal American. They don't. And in fact, they commit less crimes because if, if you think about it, a lot of these folks um, are, are trying to come here to work and they don't want to to raise any flags uh, to endanger themselves or their family. Okay. Oh, oh okay. 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 Um, and uh, do they vote? Is this why Biden won the 2020 election? They don't vote. Um, and, and you know, because of, of protections that we have in our election system, there's there's no possible way for them to vote. But what about uh, them getting access to social services? You know, a lot of the reason that they tend to be a net benefit is because they pay so much in taxes and don't get as many social services that they're not even eligible for. In fact, some folks think that the reason uh, Social Security has been able to kind of uh, right the ship financially in recent years is because of undocumented immigrants um, who are able to kind of um, uh, buoy our, our economy without taking advantage. This is no good. I don't think we can use any of this because this is making it seem like the Republican case against the southern border is just all hype and no substance. I do think there's always a, a kernel of truth in, in, in what um, anyone in politics says, even when it's, when it's covered in, in racism and, and pandering and, and lies. The, the kernel of truth is that we do have a broken immigration system and we do have a problem on our southern border. And I and I want desperately to fix that. I'm against chaos on our southern border because I care about our border communities. I care about my state. I care about my country and I care about migrants. So I, I don't want chaos. 
But what I do know is that the only way to truly fix this is not by drowning kids in the Rio Grande. That doesn't do anything and it tarnishes our, our, our legacy as a, as a country of immigrants. The only way to solve this problem is to it's create- a lava a moat. moat. I get it. A moat of molten lava across the southern border sure. from end to end. Right. Yeah. Some of this is pretty comical when the solution is staring at us in the face. And that is create more legal pathways for folks to come here and work and contribute. But what about uh, fentanyl? This is something I care a lot about. I actually passed a bill uh, last year through the legislature to fight fentanyl overdoses, uh, particularly on school campuses. We put we passed a bill to put Narcan, which is an opioid reversal medication on every school campus in the state of Texas. And it has already saved dozens of lives of young people across our state. So I oh, put sure. like that. Yeah. Doesn't this just reward people from for doing fentanyl by um, making sure they don't die? Yeah. Well, and, and here's the fact that a lot of people don't know is that 93 percent of the fentanyl that enters our country comes through the ports of entry, meaning it is coming in right under our nose. And because we haven't modernized those ports, we can't detect it and stop it. So I've, I've, instead of drowning kids in the river, instead of separating children from their parents, instead of putting kids in cages, why don't we modernize our ports of entry so we can stop the influx of fentanyl into our country? So to recap, your former middle school teacher who wants money to go to middle school teachers, uh, you are a diabetic who wants government money to cap the price of insulin. You don't want a lava moat, even though it's proven that cartels cannot cross that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in walls. I mean, listen, it's like I've never known anyone that's gotten over around or through a wall in my entire life. Really? Oh, wow. They closed the door in his grandfather's house and he died in there. Yeah, <laughs> he could not get out. Condolences to your grandfather. I, you know, I, I, what I would suggest is if your family corporation is struggling with your with your charter schools, um, is you should uh, partner with the cartels to to provide some of these uh, twelve foot ladders for the ten foot wall, um, because I think you'd make a lot of money from those cartels who continue to find ways to evade uh, Donald Trump's stunts at the southern border. Actually, one more thing uh, on the border. You should tell him about your family's Oh, experience. my God. Okay. So here, I just, my you know, personal experience with the southern border. So my family owns property near the border. And, you know, these, uh, you know, illegal, I call them illegals. You call them, you know, migrants. They cross the property uh, to enter into the country. And, you know, they're coming across my property. So I defend myself. I, I shoot at them. And I'm just really worried that if Biden gets reelected, that the Democrats are going to prosecute me because I think I might have hit, you know, a few of them. I mean, just last yeah. week, I thought I hit someone. Yeah, I, I would definitely say that that Joe Biden is the law and order candidate in this race. And if you shoot it at innocent people, you're probably going to be prosecuted as as you should. Um, and if, I think if you if you want to be able to shoot at people without any consequences, Donald Trump is probably your candidate. That's a great um, soundbite for Donald Jesus Trump. Jesus Christ, though. Like, is that so hard? He, he has said that to like two dozen active lawmakers. I said this to Paul Gosar. And he's oh. like, oh, I bless you. And it's like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're keeping America strong. Is that so hard? Y'all may know that, that Greg Abbott has has uh, insinuated that um, we should start shooting migrants at the border, that we should shoot women and children on site. I mean, th this is this is really scary terrain that we're entering uh, as a country. And you, you pair that that kind of language with some of the rhetoric Donald Trump is using, um, calling migrants animals and saying that they're poisoning the blood of our country. We've seen this. We've seen this movie before uh, in in world history, and it never ends in a good place. Um, and so I, I hope there are more um, law and order Republicans who will stand up to the idea that you can shoot people with with impunity in this country. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems like most of them are retiring. Um, <laughs> just 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 to end, because like. People outside of Texas are always promising the idea of a purple Texas in our yeah. lifetimes. Um, on, on the ground, your experience, like wh what is the political climate like now? Where is it going? I don't think you have to take promises from um, from political leaders. You can just look at the data. And Donald Trump won Texas in 2020 by five points. That's closer than a lot of states that we consider swing states. 
So based on the data, Texas is the largest battleground state in the country, which, by the way, has some of the lowest voter turnout in the entire country, which is by by design. It is harder to vote in Texas than it is anywhere else in the United States. Uh, Texas Republicans have put up so many roadblocks uh, to citizens being able to access their God-given rights at the ballot box. Yeah, you have people getting very comfortable in their districts. Yeah. Correct. Or you have what happens in New York is you have someone that knows they're not going to win as a Republican, so they just tweak their rhetoric ever so slightly. No one checks under the hood. Yeah, and then they're mayor yeah. of New York. I'm very optimistic that you're going to see Texas um, turning purple in, in the years to come, if not this year. Uh, we've got Colin Allred, who is challenging Senator Ted Cruz. And I think that race is going to be a lot closer than people think. Is there anything that an ordinary person can do in order to sort of ease this along? Absolutely. You know, there's a lot that Texans can do to, to organize their communities, to, to get out the vote and register their neighbors. Um, and then there's there's folks that people outside of Texas can do. You know, if you're if you're living in Oklahoma or in, in uh, Louisiana and you care about what's happening in your in your neighbor, um, your neighboring state, then you can always contribute money to candidates like Colin Allred and, and help them build their campaign and get their message out to voters. Because Texas is an expensive place to campaign. Um, we're the second biggest state in the country. We have some of the biggest media markets in the country. So to run ads in the Houston market, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, El Paso, it takes a lot of money. Um, so the more folks can can chip in and contribute to this cause, uh, I think the more effective we'll be. So you heard it here first, carpet bag in from other states. Let's turn California and New York red and uh, give this guy some money so he can spend it on his own insulin. <laughs> that would be great. I need I, I need to need some help with my insulin. So <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, this uh, this has been terrific. You're constantly rerunning, right? Yeah, I, I have to run every two years, so I'm on yeah. the ballot this November. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. Great. Um, and so uh, we'll we'll link to your campaign thing, also to a variety of videos uh, on social media. Killing it. Yeah. Please yeah, do. Yeah. Be sure. Woo. Okay. That was good. Woo. And inspiring because like. Obviously, it's going to take a while for Texas to truly become a purple state. Yes. I mean, if people keep leaving California in droves, as we've been promised, turn Texas red. I Wait, turn Texas. Turn Texas purple. Yeah. Yeah, turn, turn it purple. Honestly, I, I, I really hope that liberals flee the big cities so they can infect rural counties with their progressive votes. Yeah. You know, if you're thinking of buying a house just because it's cheap, but like, oh, no, it's kind of conservative, bring your friends. Yeah. Make them vote. And I don't know. It's inspiring. Yeah. No, I, the, that guy's a really great guy. Yeah. And I, he has the language and stuff that I, I hope everyone in the Democratic Party adopts. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's a great guy. And he's really laid out a blueprint for how to get things done in the state of Texas. And I think that there's an old friend of mine that I could actually really use some of this as an inspiration. Oh, who would that be? Oh, um, it's another fellow Texan. Okay, right. Hmm. Thank you for calling the Central Texas Office of U.S. Senator. They're not home. We are currently unavailable at this time. Please leave a brief message with your name, phone number, email address, and zip code. Thank you. Hey, I just think it's great that the Texas state legislature has passed a cap on insulin prices. They're working together to reject school choice. They're really doing some great things. And I think that if you didn't have your whole butthole as a hat that you wore, you flexible piece of you might be able to bring some of this camaraderie and common sense legislation that people actually like to the country. Yeah, you just uh, have to stop being a piece of for like, you know, day, two days. Yeah. So if you think that's possible, uh, we would love it. Anyways, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, Aaron, you should be Yeah, go, go. Thank you. Hey, change starts with little conversations just like this. Little fireside chats. Hmm. Yeah, um, so I just, I think we should, uh, that was very refreshing, so mm -hmm. thank you for that. But I think we should uh, just end on a, on a positive here. Sure. So this is former... Republican Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Okay. I'll give you the truth why I'm not Speaker. It's because one person, a member of Congress, wanted me to stop an ethics complaint because he slept with a 17-year-old. 
an ethics complaint that started before I ever became speaker, and that's illegal, and I'm not going to get in the middle. Did he do it or not? I don't know, but an ethics is looking at it. There's other people in jail because of it, and he wanted me to influence it. And you know what? So then they come out and they say, because I kept government open, I'd do it all over again. Gosh, I, I appreciate he doesn't want to name names, but... Yeah, I love that if you look at any comment of where that's posted, there is not a soul on the internet that doesn't know exactly who he's referring to. Oh, but he's being so coy about it. It's like, I'm not going to name names, but a certain someone who is being investigated for sleeping with a 17-year-old <laughs> prostitute and bringing them across state lines <laughs> could be anyone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I love that that's not even the reason why he got kicked out, but he's like, you know what? <laughs> Let's make up the reason. <laughs> what a piece of shit. You know, it wasn't not the reason. <laughs> it wasn't wasn't not not the reason, yeah. but I love it. Yeah, just drop it in. It. Uh, anyways, that is that is nice. What a nice time. I had a great time. And yeah. I know that this can sometimes be an echo chamber. And so I'm glad that we were able to bring in Kevin McCarthy to balance it out. Mm. And I hope that all of you in having your diverse viewpoints can come together and say terribly insane things to each other in peace and harmony like God intended. Both sides both sides. Till next week, I'm Maximilian Clark. And I'm Walter Masterson. And we're not journalists. Just, just don't even, we're, don't we're, come we're here not, for news or anything. Yeah, no. Go to NPR. No? Nope. Mm. That's too woke. Um, right. CNN. Facebook memes. Corporate. Facebook, Facebook memes. memes. Facebook memes. All right, everyone. <laughs>